my gosh. It's recording. Yay. Oh my god, we're actually recording again. And now we're done. Goodbye. Yep, Jake's computer is crashing right now. Oh, do we want to do Sam's stuff? Sam's <gasps> yes. bag? Yay. Yes, we do want to do Sam's bag, please. We want to do Sam's, Sam's bag. bag. Sam's bag. Sam's, Sam's bag. bag. It's a podcast Sam's about bag. Sam's bags. Here it this is. It's going to be completely out of context for anybody who didn't listen to the blooper sode. Oh, it's Samantha. so beautiful. It's a small little bag. There's only three things in it. That's a disappointment. Are they big things, though? I already drank this one. <laughs> <laughs> is, oh, is it the watermelon monster? Yeah, I didn't like it very much. It just sounds it bad. Yeah, I tried it and then dumped the rest out. <laughs> is, is that one of the zeros or? Uh, it's a zero uh, on the flavor scale. Yeah. Oh, dang. Oh, yeah, it's zero sugar burn. monster energy ultra watermelon, which I don't know. Ultra. I didn't, you, ultra I didn't see watermelon. regular watermelon there. Yeah, okay, like, so one drink. And then this, which I haven't Another tried drink. yet. It's like some oh, kind of sparkling. Yeah, those are good. Water. Yes, yeah, what the lemonade? See that. It's ice. What's up? Yeah, it says ICE sparkling ice classic yes. lemonade. Those are huh. good. It doesn't look solid. Is it solid? <gasps> Just yeah, the bottle. It's frozen. Just throw it on your desk. So, so yeah, two full, yeah, and like I think, like you said last time, I think it's just where stuff got messed up and there was the packaging. But this thing is like honestly is a trial. I have no idea what you use this for. It's <laughs> Bosch and Lom. I know everything's mirrored. Is it says no, no. I can no, see. No, we right can see it. We can see it. Hold it up. We can read Bausch it. Bosch and Lom Lumify. What? Uh, Redness reliever eye drops. It's monadine. It's Bauchelon clear eyes. Yeah, dry eyes. I think it's for. I think the bag was meant for potheads because it's yeah, like monster. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then, and then yeah, yeah, I just, follow up by, "Hey, we're hiring." Yeah, right. As soon as we saw like redness eye reliever, I'm like, "Oh, yeah, I know yep. what this is for." <laughs> yep. And there's this little thing in there. <laughs> oh. Oh pouch in a box and then inside the pouch is what is it like a dropper or is my it gosh yeah like how much packaging do you need <laughs> like a, a dropper well, inside of a box inside well, of it's envelope. one of those single serve droppers well, too yeah well the I'm box was like the tab off the box was like an inch and a half by like four inches something like that <laughs> yeah and it's, it's just this little two inches just, by like a centimeter yeah, uh, it's not much oh, it's like about the same size as like a harmonica i would say oh, oh gotcha or a tube of preparation. I know. That's like the most boring Mondo I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it will probably like a Mondo. <laughs> it'll probably hurt you if you try to drink it. Yeah, don't, oh, do, don't, that. don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> no, it's on the box. Does thing. it say it's do like not a, ingest? It's like a nasty no, Kool Aid. It just says works in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say anything about not ingesting. No, it's I just sure snort it, it straight to the brain. It's meant for your nose. It's just so you could see the box better. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it the the box is like here's looking at you. I know. Like if you have like red eyes and like you need like drops, like this would be the most inconvenient thing. <laughs> <laughs> like You'd probably be too no. stoned to even be able to fo- like like try to use it. <laughs> like, how do I twist this? It stuff? doesn't actually say don't drink. I don't think. <laughs> Chug it. Oh no, it says okay. yeah. Do it. Swallow, oh. get medical help. There it is. Okay, don't, oh, don't, chug it. don't chug Sorry, it. Don't chug it. Don't chug it. Don't chug it. You know, Kyle, it'd be more like, uh, oh, my eyes are red. I need to go to work. Uh, here's the packaging. All right, what was I doing? Okay, I got to go to work. <laughs> and then forget. So now I can finally throw all this crap away. <laughs> I was going to hold stupid. on to that bag just to make sure we got it on record. Thank mm-hmm. you. But no dates. Yeah, no dates. No oatmeal. No hot chocolate. Two drinks and drops. Welcome to We Might Be Nerds, a podcast about fun facts, internet obscurities, and whatever we've just found interesting this week. My name's Dylan Critchfield. I'm Colin Montgomery. I'm Sarah Critchfield. And I'm Jacob Montgomery. And we finally did it. We finally got a recording session in. And today we've got what seems like a trip from the past and going into the future. 
Uh, Jake, I believe yours is chronologically the first in the timeline we occupy. So what do you got for us? Oh, wait. First, we all need to get into the Wayback Machine. Get in here. Oh, God. There's not enough room, but we got to cram in, okay? It's like a clown okay. car. <laughs> Oh dang! Kyle, get in here. You <laughs> commit to it, but but there but there's pretty <laughs> flowers. Well, let's stay outside. Okay, let's go back to March of this year when it was still Women's History Month. Oh, <laughs> when I had this topic ready, and then let's go even further back to <laughs> the late 1800s. So we're in the the time machine. We and then we're gonna put Woo! sound effects here. Edit point. Oh, uh, yeah. Sounds like a coffee grinder. Okay. <laughs> That's because it is. It's the history of coffee. <laughs> oh, gosh. No. No, we That's can't. Probably do that. Also it's got terrible. a lot of perks. Terrible and problematic. <laughs> you get off of this. <laughs> You're grounded. I mean, yes, and. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to start off to... by talking about, yes, in the Wayback Machine, 1881. And there's the director of the Harvard Observatory at the time. His name was Edward Pickering. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And the reason, yeah, like, starting with this, um, like, around that time, photography was getting a lot more prevalent. They went from, like, the... Wet plate is how they like first started doing photography, where they like this plate, and they like covered a solution. And, you know, you had, like the long exposure time where people had to stand in the same place, be very still, right? Be a and statue. They, yeah, like in the Civil War when you see all those pictures, and then around that time they developed uh, dry plates where you could like prepare, like not exactly like what film is now, you know. Not we don't even use film anymore, hardly, but yeah. you could use like a prepared plate like the night before, so it was a lot easier and a lot shorter time to take a picture. Because it was still a long exposure. Right. It was still yeah, a long exposure, but yeah, you cut down on the time a lot by like preparing these things in advance. And so yeah, they started using these on telescopes to try to map out the stars that they could see at the time. Because before, it would just be people looking through a telescope, like, okay, there's a star, you know, at this angle, at this, you know, time of year, at this time. Yeah, and charting it. And charting it. Ooh. And that took, you know, like, forever. And had a lot of human error in it. Right. That's true. <laughs> and then with the revolution with the photography, we kind of have the opposite problem, where there was so much data, but there wasn't, like, people that could process it fast enough and so this pickering guy had like a couple of like student aides and like other people that were helping him and they were just were not getting through these all this you know data that was coming in charting the stars fast enough and so famously he said that my scottish maid could do a better job than you guys and uh, it's kind of progressive cool for women but Another thing was he could hire a lot more women for the same price. He could hire men to do the same job. Oh, Oh, that kind of stinks. That does kind of stink. But it meant, yeah, like there was a lot of women that were doing like custodial type work, you know, being maids or cleaning and just, you know, teaching. Mm -hmm. They got pushed up into like this higher education field and they became known as like computers before there was, yeah, that's what they would call them because they would compute calculations based off of the photographs of the night sky they had. And like the angle and, and the angle, all the other yeah. information, yeah. Right, and they would, yeah. You can see Cosmic like, geometry. Right. <laughs> Cosmic geometry. And stellar yeah, just, work. Yeah. Mm hmm. Very <laughs> stellar. <laughs> I'm all over the place now. Uh, so let's see. So, yeah, like at the height of this um pickering had almost 90 women working for him between 1881 and 1919 i think that's when he yeah he either quit or died i'll have to look that up (laughs) but one of the people he hired yeah we'll look it up and i'll put it the historians aren't sure no they're not sure (laughs) 
He might still the be The world alive. may never know. But yeah, he's Scottish. out there somewhere. <laughs> he's in a cave in Argentina, you know, mm-hmm. like, like, you know. He, they put him inside Hanging out with all this. He, yes. <laughs> and yeah, like the his Scottish maid, her name was Wilhelmina Fleming. And she was so good at like doing these computations and copying the the dry plates where the photos were on to paper. They would still do that, but it was a lot easier since you didn't have to like look in a telescope and then go over here and write it down. You just like look at the plate and then put it on the chart. Yeah. And she worked at the Harvard Observatory for 39 years. Good tip. Wait, this was at Harvard? At Harvard, mm-hmm. where, yeah, like. Wow. And, Way and to this, bury the lead. <laughs> right. Well I, well, I said at the beginning that this guy was the director of the Harvard Observatory. Oh, all right. I. My apologies. But it's fine. No, there's Short a lot of loss. information dump here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, like at a time when there was like only a handful of like women's colleges, it's kind of amazing to have like a woman and women doing this kind of work, especially like just post Civil War. Yeah. Pre suffrage. Right. Yeah. That's still like really cool to see like women doing like actual scientific work in the early 1900s i mean it it definitely wasn't common but to have that kind of bulk of women working on stuff uh you know, pro- pay problems aside that's honestly super cool well yeah. wasn't it true that she did do a better job than his actual assistants yeah it was that was like the main thing and then like under that like you get the read like the subtext was like but they could also pay like women half as much and I'm like, Which, dang uh, it. oh dang! <laughs> you had to go and ruin it. Damn it! History. But she apparently, yeah, yeah like uh, she did get like a raise, and she got um, named. So like they were all like computers, like it was like their title. But she was like the director of the charting, or oh, not like the director, but she was like right under him in charge of like all the ladies. Like after 15 years of her being there, so that's. Pretty she awesome. did get yeah like a pay raise because she kept saying and like she's like a diary and she's like if we're doing the same work we should be getting paid the same which unfortunately we're still fighting that battle dealing with some of that you know yeah around yeah. now yeah you'd think after you know over a hundred years even past that point yeah yeah <sighs> I don't know that sucks but yeah we're making it you know we make it in our way. So, yeah, just thought it was pretty cool. And apparently, like, people that work, like, even at NASA, they still use a lot of these star charts. Wow. Wow. That's just, like, cool. the most, like, yeah, robust, like, collection. Because, yeah, like, another interesting thing with the photography I read is that even, like, with the naked eye, there would stuff that would show up on the telescope and on, like, the negatives that you couldn't see with the naked eye. Or you wouldn't, like, notice just by glancing at, you know. Yeah, but when you expose it, expose that it right that time, amount of time, yeah. yeah. And yeah, and that's like when they started like not only like charting where stars were, but realizing, oh, some of these are like they're moving. Bigger. Yeah, some of them are moving or some of them are much brighter or bigger. So they actually like from that started like the whole classification where you have you know like white dwarfs up to red giants. Red and all giants, that. yeah. yeah. I have to wonder how much of the uh, the mathematics that they discovered and founded uh, is still in use today in modern charting and, and in the computing associated with modern star charting on these more, the more powerful cell- telescopes we have today, you know, Hubble and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, if they don't, if not like similar, at least it's all foundational for what they do today. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know. Putting the building blocks in place is super important and as super cool piece of women's history. And yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And yeah, with all the, I mean, I couldn't get too much into all the astrophysics since I don't actually understand that stuff that well. <laughs> <laughs> but the topic's kind of really cool. S- yeah, it is pretty yeah. cool. The, the fact that it came from a, you guys suck, this person could do better than you, is yeah. like and an also offhand from, comment. Like, Going from, well, we're just going really slow because it's hard to collect the data to we have so much data and we have no way to process it all. Yeah, that's kind of a good problem to have. Right, kind yeah. Of, like, be yeah. nice. Yeah, be better if they could. Like, here, let's create some jobs. Right. But let's pay them equally. Please. Yes. Why don't you? 
Why don't you? Why, why don't you pay them equally? <laughs> So, quick side note: I I know you'd been holding on to that topic since uh, March. Uh, again, we we had some delays, some technical difficulties. <laughs> it's not March we're anymore. Here now, no. Yes, uh, it's so ups- March. It's almost March. It, it, it's it's today's the month. March fifty uh, sixth, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, actually, the day this episode is going to come like out, uh, the month will at least start with M again. So mm-hmm. we're going to eleven fifth. There you go. Something along those lines. Well, it's. Speaking of, like, dates and stuff, moving a year up the timeline to 1882. <gasps> Big jump. Going. Eight, I think I've teased this to you guys. Did you we just so, wait for it? In 1882, entrepreneur Jacob Luce bought a biscuit and candy company with his brother Joseph. At the time, cookies were still called biscuits, so keep that in mind. It, over in Europe, they still call what we in America call cookies, biscuits. So they found this company, which came to be known as the Loose Wiles Biscuit Company after they partnered with John Wiles. So Jacob Loose was prominent enough that he was seated on a board of a budding conglomerate called the National Biscuit Company. Uh, thanks to advances in manufacturing and transportation, you know, these companies could get larger in scale and start distributing wider. So Loose Weil and Lit Wiles envisioned factories filled with sunlight, and Jacob Loose divested himself in 1902 of the National Biscuit Company, which would later become known as Nabisco. And they founded their own company based on their vision of these factories named Sunshine. It would be 44 names before they officially changed the name from Loose Wiles Biscuit, but their flagship product they would launch in 1908 a sandwich cookie with white filling and chocolate cookies it's not the one you're thinking of this is hydrox the other Has one Has anybody on this podcast ever had hydrox no i could I just, not find hydrox i just if know I they were it. around before the other one <laughs> yep yep so uh kyle uh I can tell you exactly where to get them. Uh, go over to Cracker Barrel. Oh my gosh! They're one, they have a they're one of the biggest carriers. Hi. Yes. Oh my gosh! I want to get some Hydrox, some Hydrox cookies, please. please. <laughs> oh my gosh! It's so Except amazing. What's that? You take the label back. Oh no! It's oh, it's or it, dang it! It's Hydrox. Sh- Kroger <laughs> brand. Dang you don't it! Get to say it yet. <laughs> well, actually, Kroger uh, up until recently was also one of the major carriers of Hydrox. Oh, oh, of ooh. course. <laughs> so Hydrox. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it is basically Oreos before Oreos. The main differentiating factor being that the cookies are a lot more brittle, a lot harder, tougher, for lack of a better term. I've actually had Hydrox. Um, I had them a couple times. And I remember it because I was used to having Oreos at our grandmother's house and the crunchy texture, uh, the hardness of it was... A bit disappointing, as well as the fact that they don't absorb milk very well. Oh. The uh, the flavor of Hydrox cookies is more like brownie. It's more chocolate rich, uh, which I, I would say it's in its favor. And the cream is a bit sweeter. The, uh, the Hydrox is a bit more bitter in taste. The cookies of an Oreo are a lot sweeter. So the name Hydrox was derived from hydrogen and oxygen which was meant to imply purity, uh, evoke, you know, hydrogen, oxygen, water, purity. Mm-hmm. Well, that didn't quite work. <laughs> no, it, yeah, it sounds, you know, it sounds like chemicals. For yeah, some yeah. Reason. It, it sounds, sounds like, like chemicals. Clorox, which I think was a product around the same time. Probably. Which is chlorine and oxygen. Uh, or yeah. hydrogen peroxide. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yum, so, delicious. So Delicious cookies to make you gag. Yep, dig, so again, dump, dunk them in. Uh... Four years later, uh, National Biscuit Company would create Oreo, but that wasn't their immediate problem. In the 1910s, Hydrox, again, instead of evoking thoughts of purity and water, made people think of hydrogen peroxide. At the time, there was an existing Hydrox chemical company. Oh my gosh. And in fact, they got <laughs> Sunshine got caught up in a trademark lawsuit as the term was used for coolers, soda, and even ice cream brands. Uh, so they had a lot of lawsuits to deal with. And over the next, you know, intervening 40 years up until the 1950s, uh, Hydrox is 
branding was basically warning customers of imposters doing the uh, <laughs> 1900s equivalent of saying, we were first. This is the reason you should buy our product is because we did it first. Uh, yeah, the, a lot of the uh, the advertising is just look out for imposter cookies. Don't be fooled. Hydrox is the cookie the kids take to school. You know, stuff like that. There, there's a lot of weird ads. <laughs> I'm not Those sure. ads. Oh, <laughs> okay, that's weird. Yeah, that's funny. It's really, really old timey. It, it it again. We're talking 1920s to yeah. 1950s here. Uh, Oreo sales did turn around with an aggressive ad campaign and a redesign in the mid 1950s. Also, interestingly, a price increase actually drove more sales because they were uh, marketing Oreos as the highest class biscuits. Uh, this is like a premium product. Yeah. Well, yes, Boy, premium product biscuit. marketing. It's worth your money. Taking the Apple strategy, basically. Or is it that Apple did the Oreo strategy? That's a hey, that's fair. That's fair. Oreo did it first. Apple's the imposter. Yeah, I I knew about Hydrox because uh, again I'd been disappointed by them in the past. Uh, you know I didn't appreciate not sweet flavors when I was looking for, you know, Oreos. But yeah, four years after Hydrox, Nabisco released what they would call at the time the Oreo biscuit, which got renamed. No less than three times to <laughs> Oreo sandwich, Oreo cream sandwich, and finally Oreo chocolate sandwich cookie in 1974, which is still the official name of the product today. Okay. Delicious. But Delicious. It's like Oreo and then it's like sandwich Subtext. cream cookie. Uh, they need to uh, rename those to chocolate monstrosity cookie. That's, <laughs> That's basically what Oreos like, and, and Hydrox are. Keep up with the number of, yeah. May or different kinds of Oreos. There's, there are no- there's over a hundred varieties. 150. Yeah, Ooh, that's, like that's not a joke. That's kind of actually what spawned this topic is a video we were watching. So some differences and some problems for Hydrox and why it failed? Question mark. It's still around. Yeah, they they brought it back. Well, yes and no. So that 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 gets a little bit more interesting. Hmm. So Hydrox was introduced again. Crispy or cookie, notably non-absorbent, uh, but the cookie was always kosher. They used real sugar, and uh, it was one of the first cookies to use an industrial press mold. It was one of the first molded cookies, which is, uh, from a technological standpoint, a pretty neat little fact there. Oreo, uh, Nabisco with Oreo opted for softer cookies that were very absorbent to milk, a sweeter cookie flavor, and a rich filling which until the 1990s was made with lard nice there was actually a whole uh to do in the 90s about the koshering of oreos factories um you know they had to have a a rabbi come in and uh basically torch the ovens to uh cleanse them of impurities was uh, that was a part of the process which Mm. i i had no idea about but Man, this poor, these poor guys at Sunshine, uh, despite the fact that Hydrox didn't, you know, make as big a dent of Oreo, uh, Jacob Luce, he retired a rich man. I got two words for you. Cheez-Its. Mm-hmm. So they, they made it big with Cheez-Its. But, no, Hydrox, the, the brand got tossed around quite a bit. Uh, Sunshine got absorbed at some point. Sorry, I gotta go through my notes. Cheese its cheese its are better than cheese nibs. Okay, yeah. So Sunshine went belly up after Oreos uh, overtook them. Right, Hydrox was eventually destined for the dustbin of history, but it got ping ponged between companies such as the American Tobacco Company. Keebler and Kellogg's. Kellogg nice. attempted to fix the name issue by rebranding them as Droxies, but only two years after they assumed ownership in 2001, Hydrox was removed from the market. Here's the power, though, of brand tribal fandoms. There was a dude who was such a super fan. He founded a company called Leaf Brands, 
reverse engineered the recipe and got the rights because uh, Kellogg's wasn't using it. And Leaf Brands took ownership of it and reintroduced Hydrox uh, in geez. 2015 after multiple years off the market. And that's the current uh, producer and distributor of Hydrox's Leaf Brands. They they basically took a lot of notes, uh, you know, old packaging. They took did a, like a lot of research into recreating this cookie because Hydrox has diehard fans. You know, it's like Pepsi versus Coca Cola, mm-hmm. and you know some people swear by it. They like the brownie tasting cookies and the sweeter filling versus what you get with Oreo with the richer feeling and the sweeter cookie. And, you know, textural differences. You know, people have preferences. They're allowed, but. There is a Hydrox Facebook page that is basically the company being like, we're available here now. We're distributing here now. Hey, Amazon ran out. We're going to restock on this date, and they'll, you'll be able to order them by the box of six packs. You like know? a logistics manager or something like that. Yeah, like it, it's got a very dedicated fan base who are like, we want these cookies. I so bet. good oh on Leaf gosh. Brands for uh, you know bringing the cookie that people wanted back, you know. A small market share is better than no market share at all. And, you know, little guy yeah. has a place in the market. But I guess it is more of like a novelty yep. than like a mass market appeal at this point. Yeah. Kind of like, at this like point, you said, a lot yeah. of the stuff at Cracker Barrel, you'd see like Abba Zabba's and Charleston Chews that I don't usually Ooh, see anywhere Moxie else. Soda and. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try it. I, I, I think we should all somehow procure a pack and, and try it. Yeah, so I, absolutely, that'd be amazing. He was on the microphone. Yes. I have a unopened box of Oreos here. Uh, I was trying to find Hydrox before I discovered Amazon was out of stock at the time, and I haven't been back up uh, near your way, Kyle, to stop by Cracker Barrel yet. Mm-hmm. But I am, I am dead set. I'm going to get a package of Hydrox, and I will somehow get some to each of us to do a direct compare. I, I know, Yay! like, uh, Kot- cookies. Kotaku and a few other publications have done, like, cookie offs. But, you know, we're our own people. We can form our own opinions. And yeah. I really just, I really just super want to try these things after reading so much about that them. It's funny. Yeah. Jake, are you around a Cracker Barrel? Yeah, there's one in spring. Or yeah. wherever I live. Wherever he lives, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, what a good. Yeah. Spring I'll, I'll, I'll cut this bit, but. Jake, there's only you- one Springfield in the United yeah. States. Yeah, only yeah. one. Yeah. Only one, Jake. If you uh, if you get a box, I will I will pay for them. <laughs> okay. If you Fine. see one, buy three. <laughs> yeah, I do like how you said earlier, like the Coke Pepsi comparison. Except it's like if Pepsi came and like copied Coke and then completely like threw them to the dustbin, and like everybody thought Pepsi was like the original cola, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that there is one of the articles I read did reference the Pepsi Cola thing as actually being very similar in nature i did not read into that i think yeah like there was at one point where you like coke could have bought pepsi and they decided not to because they're like well you guys are just gonna die and they came back yeah yeah we have they're both giant market forces today at this point yeah that being said between the two of them um actually dr pepper predates both of them not by much but they predate both of them and was supposed to be uh you know a competitor offered very different beverages but um yeah still predates them so i i kind of think of it more along those lines that's fair well in the case of hydrox it feels like they had this patent and then when the patent was up oreo swooped in was like okay we tried these we can do better here's what we're gonna do and then everyone liked that. I don't think you can patent recipes. I, I do think they uh, – I, I, like, I know you can trademark. Uh, I didn't see anything about patents in any of the research I did, though. It, it does look to be act- an actual imitator that just mm. went with a completely different formulation. They liked the concept, but they did it their own way for yeah. sure. I mean, obviously, they can't like stamp Oreo on a Hydrox and say, oh, this is a Hydrox, <laughs> yeah. but – the, yes. One thing I'll note is the patterns are very uh, similar in the early days. Uh, Hydrox has this flowerish pattern that Oreo was very similar to before they got to the new kind of spacey uh, prints we have now. So that that was pretty neat because yeah, the the original Hydrox was very flowery, uh, very floral in its design. Uh, is it similar to kind of 
Is it similar to kind of like the generic um, sandwich cookies that you yes, kind of see? Yes, it, it's, it's very similar. Oh, okay. Uh, the generic Oreo sandwich cookies uh, that taste more like Oreo actually have a pattern that is more similar to Hydrox. Gotcha. Yeah, because that's kind of what it reminded me of a little bit. Yep. Was Hydrox always only chocolate, or do they also have like... They the did half? not have varieties. That's, that's one of the other things okay. oreo was messing with other flavors as early as 1924 which was was it 1924 no that's kind of 1920 crazy. the first Ooh. lemon cream filled oreo was released Ooh, that sounds good was it still with a chocolate biscuit or yes interesting yeah it was discontinued in 1924 before being brought back but like oh. Oreo obviously has done all these different varieties and like there's so many Oreo varieties. It's mind boggling. Yeah. But like Hydrox just always stuck to their guns, stuck to the same formula, uh, was always kosher. Good on them for that. But where, where they really bungled it was marketing and lack of innovation okay. for sure. There is still a big ongoing dispute between Hydrox and Oreo in the legal field. So in 2018, Leaf Brands filed an injunction with uh, the FTC complaining about anti-competitive nature and unfair advantages from Oreo and its owner, Mandela's International. Because Mandela's is also a distributor, so they, they're the ones who ship stuff to the store, and more importantly, they're the ones who kind of have a say in how the stores are laid out, the cookie aisles laid out. So they accused them of using their market position for an unfair advantage because they had people on the ground through social media who were seeing Hydrox packaged uh, to uh, on the shelves way up or way low out of sight, and most most of the time turns so that you couldn't actually even read the package or see what the product was. It is an ongoing $300 million lawsuit. Which seems so ridiculous. Like So that, petty. Like, why would Oreo need to even do that? Because they're already so Everyone huge. Everyone already loves Oreo. I mean, I... Uh... There's a lot of... A lot of conflicting information, you know. They're at a Kroger, they're like, we're supposed to be next to the Kroger sandwich creams. But the store manager found the Hydrox on the top shelf where shoppers couldn't see them. And uh, they, uh, the manager peered back a clear plastic marker on a lower shelf of Nutter Butters to find the sticker for Hydrox. Um, you know, actually, I think I think that $300 million is actually, I think, I want to say it was $800 million. But Yeah, that just seems ridiculous. Yeah, it is ridiculous, but and the uh, the lawsuit is still ongoing. I have not found a resolution to this legal dispute. Yes, eight hundred million dollars in damages wow. due to lost sales and reputation from Mandela's International, wow. maker of Oreo cookies. Such animosity. I mean, do they really need to try to snuff out this uh, that competition, whatever it is? I mean, I, again, the uh, claims seem dubious. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. You could leave it up to any number of factors, but like they're they're using social media, they're using pressure. Like I, it could be true, it could not be true. But the the fact of the matter is, Oreo is the cookie that everybody knows. I I cannot think of a person in my life I could point to a person and say they've never had an Oreo because like what? after going kosher, uh, Oreos are actually vegan, like. I know a few vegan folks who they're like, yeah, Oreos are vegan. I eat the crap out of these, mm -hmm. you know, um, or I just like the cream. Out of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't think of a person who's never heard of or ate an Oreo. It's the cookie, but you know, Hydrox has its diehards. They're obviously still getting business with, uh, you know, their Facebook with thousands of followers, people buying it up. And Le Leaf Brands is a smaller company. They're doing hundreds of thousand dollars in sales. I think they're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I just think what this lawsuit comes down to is needing to accept their place as a niche market. Because yeah. a lot of people don't, and at least in my experience, don't uh, appreciate bitter like cookies, you know, with with that sweet cream. Mm -hmm. like. We're so used to the sweet cookies with the smooth cream. So, yeah. 
It's definitely worth trying, at least. No, yeah, for we, sure. We will try to get some Hydrox and, and now, try them on like, the next episode. Yeah, I'm probably like misremembering. Yeah, I'm trying to remember like what cookies it was where it'd be like a clear package. And it was like three sleeves, and like two of the sleeves were chocolate, and like one of the sleeves was like vanilla. But they were that's little, just the the Walmart generic. That's the like generic. That. Okay, that's just the, yeah. yeah. I, I know them more as duplex cookies. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. yeah. There's like some where it's like yeah, one side's one, one side's like one side's chocolate, one mm-hmm. side's yeah. vanilla. I like those. I yeah, think those are typically yeah. fun. generic. They're pleasant. They're they're good. Like I I truly don't think. That formula of two chocolate wafers and vanilla filling, or two cho- or two vanilla and chocolate, or two vanilla and vanilla. I, I don't think that's a bad cookie formula. I, I do think, though, that most of them on the market share that ability to absorb milk and that softer texture that Hydrox can be off-putting to people who had Oreos and those varieties of cookies first. When you bite into a cookie and it doesn't immediately crumble and you actually have to apply force to it, that's something that can be a non-starter for a lot of folks. The flavor is another it's factor. It's a uh, jaw-exercising cookie. Yeah. I wonder if it's like more like a, a holdover from, like, you were talking about how, like, the word cookie and, like, biscuit, or, yeah, the word biscuit is used in Britain if their cookies are more harder like that. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure I... I've got a guy I can ask, though, uh, okay. about his snacks. So, uh, his And I knew culture. someone who, like, you know, it was really bothered by, uh, you know, down here things being called, uh, uh, like, biscuits being something other than what a cookie is. Yes. And, uh, like, any time that anyone would mention biscuits and gravy, they, he, the first image would be a cookie covered in, in gravy, which is oh, gross. Mm, delicious. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yummy. Yes. Breakfast gross. and dessert. At the and same like, time. Yep. Crackers are like they, a party favor. <laughs> yeah, they so, prefer yeah. the term scone for the, uh, like, what we call a biscuit. So, yeah. Gotcha. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Anyways, we'll not get anyway, into that. Yeah, well, um, I, that's, that's a good point you make, Jake, though, because, like, here in, you know, America, they we have a lot of things that are infused with sugar or high fructose corn syrup. Uh, we are definitely the nation of the sweet tooth. Uh, so I don't think it's unfair to assume that, like, other places they might be a bit uh, less soft, a bit more bitter in flavor. Not not unsweet, but... And, yeah, it, not as worried about dunking if they're just, like, eating the thing with, like, tea or something. Or that yeah. they wouldn't dunk it, really. They would just yeah. have it with it. So, you know, I, I can forgive all that. What I can't forgive is the fact that they put butter on every sandwich, no matter what's on it. <laughs> I can't uh, forgive that. that. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so now we're dunking on England. No, dunking. I just... So uh, we're just dunking cookies, not dunking on people. No, we're not. No, it's just a fact that I learned and I, I couldn't pass up the opportunity Yeah, yeah to aren't mention. they the purveyors of the butter sandwich? It's just like a sandwich yeah, I believe with so. butter that is it like my favorite one's like butter. the the toast sandwich where it's two soft pieces of bread and then in the middle is a toasted piece of bread covered in butter <laughs> oh my god you made that up no <laughs> <I'm> not. <laughs> we're not still playing the J- did jake make it up game <laughs> oh goodness that's a thing I'll, I'll have to send a link to you yep after this please do there is a sandwich called the chip butty, which is um, just two pieces of bread and then fries in the middle. That's it. <laughs> that sounds something like that kid me would have just loved. Yeah, oh, I would have loved that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my god. Now gosh. serve it with potato bread, and is it just potatoes? It, it's just oh, all, it all potatoes. Yes. All potatoes. All potato all potato. the time. Oops, all potato. Welcome to the Potato Network. We're talking about potatoes today. Taters. We don't Tater. air in Ireland. Please, thank you. <laughs> What's taters? Uh, oh man, I felt Toast like I was sandwich. too old before I realized that or Ida was Oregon and Idaho. Uh, I, <laughs> I was like a month, uh, like a month ago. I think I learned that. Which is yeah, no, I, I was today years old. old. Today <laughs> years old. T I L. Today I. Learned. I know I learned it far too late into my life to. Uh, but yeah, I don't know why it's about embarrassing. Myself. Yeah, but it is. Yeah, toast sandwich. Mmm, delicious. So many carbs. So we have tangented our way away from uh, biscuits slash cookies to sandwiches to potatoes. I think that's we, not my sandwich. <laughs> that's not my sandwich. 
But Oreos, uh, are you, uh, uh, you guys, are you standard Oreos, double stuff, or those golden Oreos? Because those seem to be the big ones. I do love me some golden Oreos. I like to cook with them. Ooh, yes. I like to make cheesecake with them. Oh. It's kind of how I got this guy to marry me with the cheesecake. That, that wasn't the deciding Oreos. factor, but the the, oh, the strawberry well, cheesecake with the uh, crushed golden Oreos uh, as the pie crust. Uh, uh, except that this good. fool Pretty got good. so sick because he ate all of the cream <laughs> while I was making the cheesecake. <laughs> it's true. Twenty-year-old uh, me was. Uh, not, Not the as brightest. healthy. Don't you know that's bad for you? <laughs> it, yeah, that's fine. At least it wasn't lard it at that point. It was great for me. I Not didn't lard, have to eat it. Gone by the nineties. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, shortening now. I our our grandmother uh, has always kept the double stuff variety, but I don't mind the. I I, I think I prefer the regular. Uh, stuffed chocolate. I also have you had the thins. I do like the thins. The thins are good. I mean, the thins are pretty definitely good. Definitely not the best bang for the buck. That uh, that you can't get no. better than the original. But they're 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 more dunkable. Yeah, they're they're pretty dunkable. But I usually don't even dunk my cookies. I usually take the cookie, I take a bite, and then take a sip. That's gotcha. how I do it. That's not how you're supposed to do Oreos. What about I you, don't Jake? care. That's the way I like it. Um. <laughs> And it's probably not even true, but I do like the holiday ones that aren't different flavors. They're just, just different, different colors. colors. Yeah. Yes, because I feel like they're fresher, even though they probably yeah. are not. Uh, well, no, they they are produced like seasonally. That's a, that's a fair reasoning. But yeah, mm-hmm. especially that. like the Halloween ones with the orange. It's probably mm-hmm. my favorite. Yeah, that's yeah, those I, I do well. like those. Those are good. I also do like the different uh, presses they do for those. Uh, mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. Just something, just the texture being different, mixing enough. it up. Yeah, right. I would have to taste test those, but it's not the right time of year. But no, they're now all going to taste the hungry. same. <laughs> they're all just going to yeah. taste the same. No, nope. yeah, <laughs> probably than the, right. the pumpkin, Kyle. This one tastes more red. They Tastes do have pumpkin red. varieties. Yes. Yes. There's no. That's not a joke. They have pumpkin well, spice varieties oh, 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 because they have oh, to. Uh, because pumpkin spice. Oreo yes. has every flavor. Changed my mind. Yeah. For a funny Oreo bit, go watch um, College Humor's Oreo CEO video. Sounds good. That is fully what inspired me. And to then look at also Hydrox. watch the the bonus content video. Wow. Uh, that's only if you have a dropout subscription. But the Oreo CEO is available on YouTube. And I will put that in the definitely show notes. worth the watch. I think we've rambled all about cookies and uh, no, this is now just a cookie podcast. <laughs> Welcome to We Might Be Nerds. This is a podcast about cookies we like to eat. Welcome to be <laughs> We Might Be Cookies. Uh, <laughs> oh, we yes. gotta change the name now. See, I gotta redo the website. I gotta Welcome redo the album art. Dunk. Be a oh, redo it all. <laughs> Start over. Ooh, so where are we at in our time machine? We well, uh, I've brought us up to modern day with the uh, the recent lawsuit as recent as twenty eighteen that is still ongoing. Apparently, uh, I haven't found anything to refute that at this time. So, Kyle, I've got like twenty twelve to current. What have you got? I got twenty fifteen to the current. Mm. So I guess I gotta go first, huh? Well, I Keep guess, us in order. But we're gonna have to back up a little bit as soon as you get to the me. The best so. for last. The best. Oh. The best. The best. The best. Calm down, there, Dave Grohl. He's gonna give us all the bang for our buck. Oh, I do have the beard, so yeah. you do. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get in trouble. We're saying it too well. <laughs> yeah, an octave. Oh, copyright strikes. Sure. Let's just record. Oh, <laughs> I did sing it in tune. Dang it! If and only we I can was bad. Publish to YouTube. All right, fine. <laughs> Demonetized. <laughs> We're not monetized no. in the first place. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> never oh, happened. Man. Never will. Yes, please pay us. Where's that mattress at? <laughs> <laughs> we spent it on cookies. We might be nerds. Cannot be bought. <laughs> yeah, we really can't. Can. <laughs> <laughs> it is that we can't be bought or no one will pay. P- anyway. Please buy us. Nope. Uh, we're not exactly marketable. <laughs> no. Nope. Nope. We're not sellouts. We're not sellouts. <laughs> Unsustainable. <laughs> Ooh, but are we retainable? I believe so. What do you got? <laughs> what, what about explainable? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so. You guys ever been out on a drive, nice day, windows down, 
and then all of a sudden the truck in front of you just spews out this nasty black cloud of smog oh, you just like okay. choke on it for a bit and you gotta roll the windows up but you're too late and it's just unpleasant and then you think wow that went directly to my lungs how much of this is going in the air this is everywhere i don't like that guy That's why'd you buy that car experience. thank you <laughs> <laughs> so we can all agree that diesel engines are terrible for polluting yeah. and not to mention factories that do this too uh luckily like it's somewhat regulated here but in other countries it is not regulated as much so back in 2012 this guy anarud sharma he was studying at MIT, and he went to India to further his studies because of unregulated pollutant laws and whatnot. And he had this idea to capture the pollutants that come off of smokestacks and cars and turn it into usable ink. Ooh. And... Came, did all this work over in India, came back to MIT, and he initially started by basically pranking one of the printers at MIT. He, his initial prototype, um, he captured the soot from a candle and put it in an ink cartridge and swapped it out with printer cartridge. Man. And no one was the wiser that it was made from air pollution, or from soot and he went on to develop some more tech some pretty uh wild looking devices that were retrofitted onto cars um to capture these pollutants coming off the cars where it basically looks like the like an old school cartoon like the giant funnel things on the villains cars yes oh yeah so, that's funny <laughs> he, and then he'd have it there or drive around trying to actually, you know, filter it out of the air itself. And eventually got a nice uh, streamlined device called the Ka-Link, um, which uh, Kala is the Indian word for black. So it captures the soot. Then they can, like, refine it, take out all the heavy metals and any kind of toxins out of it. And um, then they can process it into ink for various different purposes. And uh, they actually have a whole company, Graviki Inks. Or, hold up. Let me make sure I got the name right. Hold up. Hold up. Uh. Graviki Labs. And that's like gravity, but with a K. And they've got different kinds of... Um, inks that they can use now where they partner with companies for like their commercial packaging um silk screen ink for clothing oh. and there's actually as of last week another company picked them up to do fashion really um, wow panja pangaya 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 sorry if i mispronounced no it's it's pangaya with a g or pangaya like Earth. Gotcha, 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 uh, gotcha. And then they also partner with a lot of uh, companies that make pens and art supplies. So if you're looking at pens to buy and it says, like, anything with air on it, it's made from some kind of air pollution. And to really get their product out there, out in Hong Kong, they hired a whole bunch of street artists to basically graffiti Hong Kong with this ink and hey this mural was done with air pollution and it was actually a big hit and a lot awesome. of people loved it it's a big state yeah it's right there How yeah is. like like i think they had hundreds of artists that took part in this and like uh, they only do black ink because they don't color the the soot but like, traditionally, inks are made from already burning fossil fuels, so why make more of a mess when you can just kind of clean up what's already there? Love that. Um, 
yeah, and like some big companies that already use them are like Heineken and Dell and MasterCard wow. use them for all their stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and um, like with this uh, Colink device, because they they retrofit it to the exhaust of a diesel engine, I believe. About 45 minutes of the diesel car pollution can fill a whole pen. So that's pretty quick to make some writing tools. Wow. Uh, and you said they have some more industrial versions of that as well to like put on smokestacks for like, yes, factories yes, and such? Yes, they, they have large ones that go on smokestacks and um, other kind of diesel generators. Like... I love this idea, and I, I see it go in places. Like, I knew that there were filters for this kind of stuff, but I didn't know that they were actually doing something with the byproduct. That's that's pretty yes. great. Yeah, like reduce carbon footprint, acquire ink, maybe lower ink prices, since it's the most expensive yes. in the world. Yes, HP. Come that on, too. HP. Just don't buy it. So... <laughs> 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 oh no! Sorry, but, <laughs> I hate but he, HP. When Sorry. He was, <laughs> I get it. Yeah, yeah. But when, while he was working on this project, he was also trying to just like um, put previously filtered uh, carbons and soot to use. So companies just started sending him bags of this soot <laughs> for him to use. Like he just like I was reading. This I apologize, I read this a while back, but just photos of these massive bags, like like how you'd see sandbags for floods, uh -huh. but like full of soot. Oh, wow. Just walls of these soot bags that they'd find, experiment different ways to refine it into safe ink. That's got to be a hell of a day at the shipping dock where like a, a semi pulls up and you open up to just giant sandbags of so it's like who ordered all this? Where did this come from? What's happening? Yeah, and it's just like these companies just trying to offload their toxic waste. <laughs> right. Uh Turning hey, around I mean, if it has a use. Yeah, turning around and reselling that. What's your sales pitch for that? It's like, uh, it's a bag of mm, black. You want it? <laughs> yeah, because at first they were just giving it to them, but then when they found out that like it's being turned into a product, they're like, well, we'll sell it to you. Mm -hmm. So they had to kind of figure out, okay, how much could I buy that for so that I'm not burying myself? <laughs> yeah making these things. You can things. have it for a price. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for money. But yeah, no. That's definitely awesome. Because, like, you'll see, like, people, the companies for marketing will say, this packaging was made with, like, 100% post-consumer, like, paper, fibers, mm -hmm. but they're still printing stuff on there, and that's, like, like you said, coming from, like, petroleum products. Yeah. So yeah. they can both have, like, post-consumer, like, paper and... Like recaptured soot as the ink. Yeah, I think that's that's awesome. Yeah. And just to further that point, like we live on a planet that guys, we got we got limited resources for like right. the things we can mine. Being able to take byproducts and post products of the things we're using and then reuse them, that's an insanely valuable concept that they're putting into motion. Like you know, metals are recycled like nothing, nobody's business. Like, especially like building materials, something like over 85% of the steel used in steel structures is recycled immediately. But uh, taking what would otherwise be a pollutant and then turning it into a product that is in high demand, even in the digital age, you still have to have stuff on print. That's wild. I love that. Yeah, well, that's really cool. I will note that these artists that tried it out and like the graffiti projects and using the different writing implements, it seems like it was unanimous that they all loved the product because it was great pigmentation, actually very high quality, and did great for their art. I wonder if there's a way you can, like, I know as uh, for paints, you can buy the pigment to kind of like make your own. I wonder if they sell mm -hmm. it in that form. 
Yes, Gravity Labs doesn't directly make the writing products, uh-huh. but they do license the ink out to other manufacturers. So that's why I, I had a very hard time trying to find it. I tried to like direct order from them, like, I want to try this, but you have to look for products that say that they use air ink. I believe India ink is like, it's either them or a competitor. Huh. Um, but yeah, so it's in paint, it's different kinds of markers and pens, um, the screen printing um, for clothes, uh, product packaging. Like, if they, just, if they solely did ink cartridges for printers, that would be a gold mine right there, too. Yeah, like, the refill Cause... cartridges are actually really popular, mm-hmm. especially for the aforementioned, like, HP. We had an HP printer for a time, and the, those refill cartridges are actually a huge market. Mm-hmm. Like, get in on that because, like, the most used ink is black. And it's actually right there on their, uh, their marketing. Uh, Sarah, would you mind if I read this bit of marketing on their front page? I, d- I just, I like it. Sure. So yeah, black, the most commonly used industrial color, is produced with a large carbon footprint that contributes to the 4.2 million premature deaths linked to air pollution worldwide. So we found a way to turn carbon emissions into industrial materials. The more we make, the better our air. Mm-hmm. That That is a succinct straightforward mission statement that I, I I just really appreciate. I can fully support that. Like, please do. Have at you. Go for it. And the, the first thing you actually see, that's a little bit down the page, the first thing you see is decarbonize your production, which is mm-hmm. a nice and catchy tagline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to try to get my hands on some of these and test them out myself well, please don't put your hands on it, it that's got to be a mess no i want to finger paint with it come on kyle well, just, where's your creativity just stick your hands directly in it uh put it on the wall just yeah i'll paint our rental with it sounds good sounds good i think my landlord will love yep. it and now we're trying to perfect you might yeah, not lower it. our carbon footprint but we're trying to get the hydrogen and oxygen cookies <laughs> yes <laughs> But at least they're not carbon it's all cookies. Organic, yeah. Not carbon cookies. No. One hundred percent organic podcast. Mm-hmm. It's a very natural podcast today. <laughs> We're very. We are sustainable today. Mm-hmm. 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 This is sustainable. It, it yes. might be. Can, can Kyle sustain us through the end of this episode? Maybe. Uh, let's know. get back in the time machine. Woo! Time machine Woo! and go like uh, I don't know. Back to now again. Oh, oh wait. back to now. Back to that's the, the name. Right. That's our title. Back to now. Back to the now. Back to the now. Well, I love so many things about YouTube. I like. I love being able to subscribe to the content I want and pretty much watch what I want when I want and have content delivered directly to me. I love that kind of that kind of control mm-hmm. and a direct interaction with the people that produce it. I just I don't know. That's one of the things I really love. But then there are times when I just start diving into a rabbit hole, something I've never dealt with before, or something where it just feels like a little bit of a guilty pleasure, or, you know, just uh, a little bit of a time killer. And I remember I used to watch these, uh, like, tech fail compilation videos. Have you seen those before? <laughs> where, like, uh, catastrophic like, failures? Yeah, the catastrophic yes. failures. But it seemed like more times uh, out of anything it had to do with robots and the way that they try to coordinate and walk and try to be able to do human-like tasks but they were so rigid and stuff like they were just they would like fall when they tried to walk i know i saw a video of one of them trying to play soccer and it would like try to kick the ball and try to do it like three different times and then would just like try to reset and then just fall over like yeah but it was about like the uh, Boston Dynamics dogs. Yeah, like the Boston Dynamics dogs. They're just the movements are so unnatural. Like, like uh, if you are those robot toys from the nineties. Yeah, robot oh dogs. Yeah. yeah, those two. Yeah, uh, but like you know, it, when they're in a nice and measured environment, they're amazing things. But trying to do human like tasks, they just. They can't. There's like, you know, precise servos that are trying to move in an imprecise environment. And there's like no contour to many parts of their body or anything like that. So it's always like flat footsteps. And yeah, it's all mechanical. 
when they're trying to do real world things, they end up just really dangerous with that rigid skeleton. They're heavy and they can damage really delicate structures and, and plants and even people. If you fall on top of a person, that could hurt, especially if it's wielding a power tool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and like, have you ever seen a robot try to like get out of a moving car or not a moving car, like a parked car or like try to open a door? Have you seen how long that kind of thing takes? It takes them quite a bit it takes compared a, to a human. Yeah, no, I mean, and he, like a two, like a three-year-old kid. I know my three-year-old kid can just grab a doorknob, turn it, and walk into the bathroom while I'm trying to use it. So I'm like, great, thanks, child. I love you, but you know. <laughs> but a robot, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but you know, they're starting because you got time to finish up. First. Yeah, and robots respect your privacy too because it's one of the. <laughs> <laughs> One of the laws of robotics. It's a surveillance bot. It's here to watch. Oh, darn oh, right. God. That's, yeah, that's the opposite of respecting the privacy, Sarah. That's the opposite of what the kid does. Yeah, that's like or the no, birds. That's exactly what the kid does. That's like the whole like birds aren't real thing with like the birds being like uh, oh, like geez. government drones. Yeah. So Something how long does it take a robot to open a door handle? Oh, just gosh. for reference. I just remember I just remember seeing um, footage of one, but there was like it was already moving very slow, like just trying to but but then it was you notice that it was actually sped up three times. And you're like, oh my gosh, oh God! I mean, it took like a good like at three times speed, twenty seconds, something like that. So it was like a full minute. So it had for, a lot of calibrating. Uh-huh, it had yeah. to calibrate. It had to find the doorknob, grab it, open it securely without like you know accidentally bumping the door or shifting the frame or breaking the door handle, the handle or anything, off. <laughs> anything like that. Fair. And so. Making robots softer and, you know, a little more imprecise, but with like built in and passive countermeasures to kind of like be like mimic the human, imper- like our human imperfections that make us a little like softer. You'd mm-hmm. think that'd be the way to go. Squishy. But, you know, and the robots are getting a little better at like uh, gross motor skills, you know, like just normal walking and and moving mm-hmm. and emulating that like that, but they still really move in unnatural ways, especially when it comes to fine motor skills. That's yeah. the thing that has a lot of promise nowadays, but we have really? to re yeah, but we have to rewind back to 2015. There had been developments um, in this field as far back as, um, uh, the 2000s, and the inspiration does go all the way back to the 1880s. Really? How, yeah. However, 1880s. 1880s. Covering the full spectrum of our timeline tonight. However, all that is culminated into a project that started in 2015 at Colorado University Boulder, where they came up with a unique solution, the Hazel Artificial Muscle. It, that stands Ooh. for that stands for the hydraulically amplified self-healing electrostatic actuator, uh, and this is inspired by our biological muscles, uh, you know, uh, uh, sinew and strands and everything and all, uh, and, and with the uh, work of the inventor, based on the work of the inventor of X-ray technology, all the way back in the 1880s. Um, so what this guy in the 1880s figured out is that certain um, materials react differently to being bombarded with x-rays. They contract, like, you know, kind of like a muscle does a little bit. But it was, at that time, hard to control. X-rays were kind of new. And, and trying to develop a technology like that um, won't go fast without the aid of many other things and understanding so many different concepts and dynamics and, and in physics which just wasn't yeah. really there yet um and uh, that work continued really into the 2000s when they when they saw um these kind of like uh polymer bags that were being um inflated and deflated using air and it was kind of mimicking a little bit uh, of a muscle but it was um once again fragile hard to control and if it if it blows it blows so Using like air shocks. Exactly. And so uh, based upon that kind of technology, uh, an idea that they had was uh, basically this. Imagine you're taking a Ziploc bag, fill it with oil, uh, squeeze some of the air out of it, like try to get all the air out as, as much as you can. The bubble or, bubble or two is fine. Put a like a like a plate, like like a just a glass plate or something like that. Like, like like a sheet of glass or something like that. 
and you, if you press down on one side of this bag that is, you know, not constricted at all, you press down, you put force on that oil, it forces it out from under the plate into the rest of the bag, and you see the oil will kind of be forced, um, like, like it'll tense up and expand the oil kind of upwards, downwards, but then contract the bag inwards towards the plate. So, yes. and, and in that way, um, that kind of can mimic a little bit of what a muscle naturally does in nature. When you send an electrical impulse, like, you know, with your brain, if your brain thinks that your muscles tense up and can cause something to, you know, contract and go into a different position. Same kind of thing is, is uh, used with this. Um, and with this kind of technology is like uh, using this bag, like the bag and the plate as an example, if you put variable forces on that plate, that changes how much the bag wants to contract. So you can have very fine, precise um, contractions of this bag that can be easily controlled. Without having now, to be as yeah. precise as steps on a motor. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, replace that glass panel with two conductive plates on both sides of the bag, attracted with an electrical current, and you basically have a bicep muscle that is just controlled by electrical impulses. And you can attach a bunch of those in a row and scale up the amount of weight that that can lift. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Now, there are kind of like different types of how this muscle works. Um, there's one of them that's more in the shape of a donut where there are metal plates that contract on the inside and force it to the outside of the donut. Hmm. Um like, like, you know, you got the two metal discs in the middle and then like the whole bag is circular and all the oil gets to the outside of the circle. Uh, so that works as well. Um, that's been used for kind of, uh, uh, that's been used to actually emulate more uh, individual kind of strands of like, like uh, I saw it compared to an elephant trunk and being able to move an elephant trunk. In different okay, ways. no, that 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 makes sense. Where you like put that a series kind of... of like donut shaped muscles with plates. Yeah, and, yeah. Applying the current on one side would cause it to curve upward, and then the other one would cause it to curve. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, especially if you apply voltage to uh, like like if you got three of them kind of in a triangle pattern, kind of, and then stack them upwards. The more you um, put voltage on one side, the more the whole stack is going to want to curl one direction. Yeah. So, like, it, it works with stuff like that. Uh, but there are also mm. ones where um, when you apply the voltage, um, it, like, uh, they're large plates, and they will push together and push the liquids downwards as kind of like a, a, not a contraction, but like a, a relaxation. Mm -hmm. And uh, an example of one of those uh, types of uh, hazel artificial muscles could lift a gallon jug of milk. Really, these things like when you put them, yeah, yeah, when you put those together, and depending on, upon how much electrical current is pumped into them, um, can lift multiple times its own weight. Because these things that are being developed are made out of very lightweight um, elastomer bags uh, with a specialized fluid in them, uh, a very, very inexpensive and very, very light. So we're talking about uh, functionally a, a move from stepper motor based robotics to soft body robotics that is still electronically driven, but is uh, more synonymous with the human body and thus allows for more natural manipulation of an environment because it's using a muscular type structure, which then you could uh, combine with, say, sensors to say, yes, I'm touching something, something analogous to a nervous system sense of touch. Exactly. Is that kind of the core philosophy? Okay. Gotcha. Yes, exactly. And there's actually more to that than you realize. Um, also, if like you have them arranged in a certain way that you can link together two rods that are connected kind of by a flexible elbow or a joint, and you engage those, you can leverage one of those rods, much like the human arm with, um, yeah, much like the, the movement of your arm with your elbow. So that's basically how that would work. This sounds like a great application for prosthetics. Yes, oh, yes. That's, that's a, yes. Yep. It, it's, it's been good for, um, <clears throat> uh, for some manufacturing purposes, especially if it uh, requires very, very delicate touch, like handling fruit, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, uh -huh. you, you can, uh, that's already being used in some of those, in some manufacturing processes. Um, and wow. the, there are, 
a lot of good selling points to that too, just even in that department. But for prosthetics, it's even better news. Also, uh, these hazel actuators are able to sense when they are moving or being moved and can be tracked with a computer. So they can tell. Okay, yeah, there's the nervous you, system element. They can tell when you're doing, when you're like, you're taking one part of your arm and bending it back without your force. Um, I, I'm guessing it has to do with like, you know, the, the more the involuntarily doing that is going to change the fluid dynamics and yeah, the thus fluid shift, shift the plate. And much in the same way that like a microphone or a speaker works, it's going to create very small electrical capacitance. fluctuations. Yeah, yep. yeah, there's some capacitance. Um, yeah, so there's that as well. And you might have caught whenever I did the acronym, I said the acronym, a part that said self-healing. Mm-hmm. Yes. They have the ability to self-heal using a special insulating liquid that can patch the uh, elastomeric bag if it leaks. If it springs a leak, That's amazing. it can heal well, that bag. Like if you would tear a muscle from doing something too strenuous, they can patch it on the fly. Exactly. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how large scale that is, but for like just a simple leak, if there's been a lot of uh, repetitive motion and, and that bag kind of gets a little kinked or, you know. Some wear and tear. Yeah. It gets an RSI. It's wear and tear. It, it, it can self-heal. <laughs> So yeah, it's just like like blood platelets, like you know, coagulating to yeah. like heal wounds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I feel it, it, even in just the just in robotics, that's quite a bit of a step forward, and that is something that to this day right now is is being developed and breakthroughs are happening. Um, yeah, that's that's wild. I I, I love the departure from the uh, you know servo. And uh, hydraulic-based robotics that we see with things like Boston Dynamics. Uh, quick sidebar, uh, I just saw, when trying to remember what Boston Dynamics was called, uh, the robot dog that they sent to the New York Police Department got fired. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That was a whole big internet storm, yeah. That, that, that's a whole deal. But, no, like you are saying, for prosthetics... Um, that would give more natural motion. And uh, in terms of like things like the uncanny Valley, I'm wondering if that has any implications on how they can dress them up to make them uh, less uncanny. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to come down to how well they can structure um, these hazel, uh, the hazel actuators to actually resemble smaller parts of like especially facial muscles. That's I feel like that'll be the big challenge, trying to make those small enough to actuate. Because kind of at the moment, they more resemble larger muscles like biceps and stuff like that, uh, and are a little more large scale. They're they're really not that small and compact yet. Uh, but I feel like uh, much in the same way that uh, microprocessors are getting more and more, you know. Smaller, uh, smaller. Yeah, they're getting processes, smaller, smaller. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like Moore's. Yeah, that's Moore's law, right? Yeah, Moore's law. Yeah, yes. yeah I, I have to imagine that that is um, that is doable. Yeah, I mean, you eventually hit a point of diminishing return with Moore's law, but I, I have to imagine that they will find materials to make smaller plates uh, viable with and thinner, smaller bags. Uh, maybe not for the purpose of uh, you know. Uh, ambulating like face muscles and the like but uh getting close enough to where like robots can get out of the uncanny valley when they are presented with uh human facing tasks that would probably be ideal um yeah just to go back to the boston dynamics uh nypd bot like a lot of the problem that people had with that was that it was just cold and emotionless and unfeeling it just does its job it doesn't show off any signs of any humanity at all which uh that's you know similar to uncanny valley if not directly related and if we're gonna have robots doing jobs uh having them have familiar motion and quote body language uh might go a long way to making the general population more comfortable with their presence. Yeah, and it's definitely a more one-to-one translation of how, like, biological organisms move as opposed to, like, the servos they use on those kind of robots. So, yeah, and especially for you, I mean, if they can get small enough to do 
like the small muscles like in a finger because even like prosthetic that are like servos it's still not very fluid i think is kind of like what kyle is getting at yeah that everything's just more fluid with this yeah i think that there are some um some demos on that actually where um instead of focusing on the like the uh, the the joints and having servos there, it's actually um, focusing more on the tendons that are running down um, the the muscles oh. attached to the tendons that are running down your forearm. And they have the those. human body as a model to work off of for how to quote wire that exactly and how to uh, tune that ambulation. Mm-hmm. And I have to imagine that that's going to be far more efficient in terms of the energy used to power things like this because it doesn't take much to attract two pieces of metal or two conductive pieces of something yeah it, it's basically a uh, a soft it's a soft form of hydro uh, conventional hydraulics mm-hmm. yeah which yeah it's much it's yeah a lot more efficient than just every single joint having its own servo yeah when when you're putting a push pull force on the joints themselves rather than having the joint be the driving force that's going to have a lot more strength and a lot more uh versatility god then, so yeah. cool yeah it is because yeah because you know instead of all like the the servos working separately to mimic like a natural motion it's like all of these bags like moving together like you're talking like with the tendons like the muscles all move together mm-hmm. yes so yeah, that's pretty cool. You just you just want Baymax, Kyle, right? Is that what you're Hello, excited I'm about? Hello, Baymax, your personal healthcare companion. <laughs> that's where this Absolutely. is going eventually, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just want a giant bag robot. Yes, I want a uh, inflatable bag robot. Yes, please. <laughs> Except with more fluids. More fluids. <laughs> less Fluid air. Baymax. Less air. More fluid. Ninety nine percent hot gas. <laughs> it, no, less hot gas. More fluids. <laughs> okay. So more fluids. Baymax mm-hmm. looks like a water, oh. but not an air mattress. Well, I do right. have. Um, I have a picture of a good example of how these work. Just like a good. Um, like like it's a little uh, a, a little chart that gives good detail. Um, but also I have a video uh, that uh, puts. Uh, that demos these uh, hazel actuators that is really, really entertaining to watch. And especially if you get it in conjunction with the person doing the TED Talk uh, from uh, Colorado University Boulder, um, that is extremely inspiring to watch. I, I will trust you will send us that information. We can put that in the show notes. I, I have really those and I will that. do that. Yep. All right. Well, I think we've had a fun little trip through time from the 1800s up until the present day and definitely looking forward those muscle fibers uh that hazel technology just sounds so thoroughly intriguing i'm interested to see where that goes but i think that's going to do it for this episode of we might be nerds you guys think it's time to wrap it up oh for sure yeah i mean this, yeah. this time machine is a uh, rental so we need to return it okay we got we got this time go machine is a yeah, hot tub we don't want to have late fees some like scientists <laughs> like in this barn i don't know he let me he let me use it do we just return it to rent a center yeah we return to hg wells <laughs> i didn't get the i didn't get the additional insurance so just be careful oh we're not sure we got yeah let's let's try oh yeah we over. need a return it quickly all right thank you so much for listening to our podcast about the wild pieces of science and history and whatever we happen to find an interest in this week uh, you can find us on social media on twitter at might be a nerds pod uh, the same at might be a nerds pod you can also use to find us on facebook uh, if you want to send us an email we might be nerds pod at gmail.com is where you can drop us a line And if you want to take a little bit deeper dive into the topics we've talked about today, you can find our show notes and all of our links and references at wemightbenerds.com. As as a quick little sidebar, at some point I've apparently accidentally deleted the episode 13 show notes, so I will be redoing those as well uh, as we work to release this episode. So uh, I think that's going to do it for us. Any last minute plugs or recommendations for the week other than the uh, Oreo CEO video and the uh, aforementioned uh, Hazel videos? Sarah? Um, First, I will put a link to the TED Talk about the Gravity Inc. in the show notes as well. But um, I have a product 
that we recently tried. We are not sponsored by anybody, so this is just, we tried this, and I think it's pretty cool. Um, we tried the um, True Earth Detergent, where it's actually strips. It oh, comes yeah. in recyclable packaging, um, and the strips fully dissolve in your wash. They actually worked just as well as Tide, so I recommend trying it if mm. you're about more eco-friendly products. Yay, eco-friendliness. So, there's a thing. This is your, our belated Earth Day plug. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> belated. Every day is Earth Day. That's true. Take care of our planet. Fair enough. It's the only one we've got. All right. Any, we got anything else, guys, or are we going to wrap it up? I wish it did. All right. next time. All right. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much again for listening. I'm Dylan Critchfield. I'm Kyle Montgomery. I'm Sarah Critchfield. And I'm Jacob Montgomery. Thank you for listening to We Might Be Nerds. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, you might be a nerd. You might be a nerd. (laughs) We'll see you next time. continuing our trend of awkward and we don't know how to do the signs off. <laughs> I think all of us need to yeah. shut it at the end. That's what we should do. Uh, yeah, no, okay. I'm not doing Let's that. try it again. If you like this episode... I'm not doing a retake. <laughs> if you like this episode... You also... You might, you might be a cookie. You, you might like, also like... You, Hydrox. Bag muscles. <laughs> Brought to you by Hydrox and bag muscles. Brought to you by Nabisco. Bag muscles made disco. of air pollution. Muscles. It's a non-stop disco.